morning and turn to the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 4. We're going to be actually looking at uh, both chapters, 4 and 5. Uh, chapter 5 is a poem or a song that is given to back up a little bit of what has gone on. And so we'll be going to uh, various sections of that. I don't know how many people here remember this. It was a while ago. A person by the name of Nikita Khrushchev was a guy that was known for his shoe banging. And the words that he had said was called, we will bury you. He was threatening the premier of the former Soviet Union, Khrushchev's rise to power in the 1930s coincided with one of the darkest periods that happened in Soviet history. The great terror, Joseph Stalin, began his vicious purges. Khrushchev rose in party ranks to become the head of the Communist Party in the Ukraine and an advisor to Stalin. We have often said that we have to be careful because history can repeat itself. Some years later at this time, Khrushchev began to attack his former boss for his violent acts. On one occasion, after he vehemently denounced the deeds of Stalin, someone from the audience sent a note to the podium. The note read, What were you doing when Stalin committed all of those atrocities? Khrushchev shouted, Who sent up that note? Not one person moved. He said, I'll give him one minute to stand up, whoever wrote this note. The seconds ticked off and no one moved. All right, said Khrushchev, I'll tell you what I was doing when Stalin was committing all of those atrocities. I was doing exactly what the writer of this note was doing. Exactly nothing, because I was afraid to stand up, unquote. Well, the book of Judges is about people who stood up against the crimes that were committed against Israel. And the Bible calls them judges. And we have already been looking at some of the judges. We have saw Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar. Who could forget uh, what happened when what Ehud did? I mean, that was intense. And I told you that as we're looking at the book of Judges, it only gets worse from here, Okay. And by the time we end, not a lot gets done, and it gets more violent. Now, this week, we are going to meet a fourth judge. It is going to be a woman. And I want to say something briefly by word about the women in the Old Testament. What I want you to understand is that Many people have used the whole scenario of Deborah, who is a prophetess. We're going to be learning what that means. And all of the implications that go with that as a justification for why women can serve as leaders within the church, as pastors and elders. But one of the things I want you to notice is that God uses a woman here to shame the men. If you can remember back to Genesis 3, one of the problems of sin was that Adam did not stand up and protect his wife. He fell down on the job. And as a result of that, his wife exercised leadership as he stood by. And one of the consequences of that particular event was that God said, Your desire will be for your husband. And it's a bad translation. It's really, you're going to desire to rule your husband. But he shall rule over you. And so the consequence of Adam's failure to protect his wife was a different headship. And it has made its way into the church The headship God has placed for male leadership. Now, listen to this carefully. 
If you will look at verse 9 of chapter 4, you will see the reason why Deborah will be used here as the prophetess to gain victory. It says in verse 9, And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. Look at, for the Lord will tell, sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. The reason being is that the men in the time of the judges did a lot about what Adam did in the garden, which was nothing. They did not stand up. And in the times of the judges, we are dealing with people who are compromising with the world, very similar to the days in which we're living. And as a result of that, what will be happening is, is that the men will begin to not do anything and allow the women to take care of their battles. It's a pretty pathetic description of how far the men had come to this point. Now, I'm going to say by way of introduction, this is a woman's chapter today, all right? So you women get to glory in this because this is a powerful chapter. This, by the way, is also a chapter as a wake-up call for the men because God's intention was that the male was to provide the spiritual leadership, and that's the same today. The male is to provide the spiritual leadership within the family, and oftentimes it's the other way around. So as that is a background, the story about Deborah was not to condone women leadership, but to use them to disgrace the male headship. There was not honor in male headship. By the way, men showed themselves very tolerant towards evil. And that is, of course, the case that we're finding the male leaders were to lead their families according to God's laws. The male leaders allowed their families to compromise with the worship of female idolatry. The male leaders stepped aside from their God-given responsibility to protect their families. And the Bible contains stories of great women that God used to accomplish great things for him. In fact, in the Bible, there are over 200 women who are mentioned by name and more than 200 that are not named. Perhaps the most unsung hero in the Old Testament is the woman that we are going to be studying today, Deborah. She is the Jewish patriarch. She is a distinguished, the only woman in biblical history that has a God-given leadership role specifically in the role of prophetess. Now, in the Bible, the word prophetess can mean two things. It can mean the wife of a prophet, or it can be the prophet herself who is delivering the message for God. And that is the one that is being used here. She is God's spokesman for such a time as this. Because of the lack of male leadership, this is Deborah's rise to power. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about Deborah. First of all is her name. You'll see there the Hebrew name for Deborah literally means bee. Now, it's interesting. The name Deborah, meaning bee, many respects, lives up to her names because scientists tell us that in all of the animal kingdom, the bee ranks amongst the highest of intelligence. And if you want to know more about bees, you can ask Duke after the service. He'll explain to you about bees. Sorry, Duke. But one of the things that we understand is that Deborah was one of the wisest women in all of the Old Testament. She had a fatal sting to her enemies. In fact, if anyone got in her way, she was ruthless in being able to accomplish incredible things. Now, as we begin the fourth chapter in the book of Judges, we read words that sound very familiar to us. It is the cycle of sin that seems to unendingly go forward. Notice it with me. Verse 1 of chapter 4, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them 
into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. So that's the first group that we're going to look at, Canaan, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herashatha. I can't pronounce that word. Uh, you're welcome to, to say it. Verse 3, Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had, now notice this carefully, 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. There it is. Now, if you'll notice behind me, we have these charts that are helping us to get our way through the book of Judges. The chronology here deals with these particular uh, units of chronology. And uh, if you have been here for our studies, we've already gone through these. If you'll notice the next chart, we know that there has been a cycle. I have put these two charts, this one and the next one, in your notes so that you can look at it. The, the, the next chart, uh, we'll look at it a little bit more deeply. They go through this, this whirlwind of a down spiral. And if you look at that chart, you will see exactly how this downward spiral happened with all of these judges. Now, here's the thing I find interesting. You would think that Israel would learn after the first several times, wouldn't you? But instead, instead of it getting better, it gets worse, which is really confusing to me. Because of all of the things that we're going to see unfold in this book, you would think that they would end happily ever after. <laughs> but the reality is, is that they end up worse than when they started. So this cycle is horrible. You had Othniel, 40 years of rest. The cycle of sin began. They had Ehud. They had 80 years of rest. And then they had Shamgar. And then now we, we have this story here. Of all of Israel's enemies to this time, there was none so powerful as King Jabin and then his commander, Sisera. I want you to imagine that these men were untouchable. They were absolutely the most powerful people around. Nobody could stand against them. Not only had they dominated Israel for 20 years, look at this, I want you to see it in the text, they had 900 iron chariots and 100,000 troops. That's a lot of folks. And in this day, iron chariots were unheard of. Now, I want you to notice the contrast. Israel had zero chariots and could only come up with 10,000 soldiers. Now, in this chapter, we're going to learn how this enemy is conquered. Now, let me ask you a question. And I'm not trying to suggest betting, but if you were to take a wager and someone said to you, 100,000 men, 90,000 chariots against no chariots and 10,000 men, would you agree that Israel's task at this point seems absolutely impossible? Yes? Absolutely. I mean, if I look at this story and I see it right now, there is absolutely no way I would join Israel's team. I mean, these guys are absolutely outnumbered. In fact, so much so that you could honestly say that it is impossible for them to be able to wage war against this army of the Canaanites. And I want you to think about that very carefully as we begin to move through the story. Because I'm telling you, there is no way that the Israelites have a chance, humanly speaking. Absolutely none. Now I want you to notice here the problem, the real issue of Israel. It's in your notes, and I want you to see these. First of all, Israel's real problem was not military, but it was spiritual. Their problem is not that they didn't have enough people in their army. In fact, we've seen times in the story where Israel's had a ton more people and they've lost. 
So their problem wasn't military, it was spiritual. Notice the next one. Their real need was not an iron smelter, but a living faith in God. And then thirdly, if they followed God wholeheartedly, God would deliver them from the most impossible situation. To teach them these lessons, now God does this unusual thing. He didn't raise up a great manly warrior like Othniel or Ehud or Shamgar. In this military hopeless situation, God chooses a woman. And we could say, behind every successful man is a woman, right? Or if you want to get the job done, give it to a woman, right? They get it done. And I'm just here to tell you, okay, I would be absolutely nowhere without my wife. Now, no amens and shouts at this point. But the reality is, is I could not do ministry without my wife. There is something about the wisdom that God gives to godly husbands. And that is a an incredible wife that is able to see things that you can't see. Now, from her example, we're going to learn from God three virtues. Three virtues that we have to possess if we're going to stand up against the forces of wickedness. So it begins in Roman numeral number one. Here it is. The first thing we're going to see is Deborah's commitment. Deborah's commitment. Now, as we mentioned earlier, God is going to use this woman to be a spokesperson to a generation of people that had lost their way. Since the men had slipped, fallen away from their intended leadership, God is going to use Deborah's commitment to teach us the three valuable lessons. Here it is in A. Number one, she was devoted to God. That's the first thing that we need to know under commitment. She was devoted to God. Look at verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipadoth, was judging Israel at that time. Now again, if you will look behind me, the word prophetess is the word nebiyah. It means an inspired woman. It is someone who stands between God and his people, someone who tells the people what God has made known. Now again, God normally uses men to be prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. But here, she is given a real task, a real office. This office is a prophetic office in which she is listening to the very words of God. And what God speaks to her, she is going to pronounce to the people. And the people are glad to have her in that position. Now, if you remember the other judges that we have looked at so far, we see that she is a woman that blesses the Lord. In fact, look over at chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse number 2. That the leaders took the lead in Israel and that the people offered themselves willingly, and notice, bless the Lord. They are following a woman who is a godly woman. A woman of high resolve and commitment. Deborah was a woman devoted to God. In fact, notice in your notes, she was willing to stand up when the men had fallen down. That's the thing you need to remember about Deborah. And the men were happy that she did. They offered themselves willingly to follow her, chapter 5, verse 2 says. So not only was she devoted to God, but notice B in your notes, she was devoted to her family. It says here in verse 4, she was the wife of Lipadoth. Now we're not told if she has kids. We don't know much about her home life, but God raised up this woman and gave her a husband who supported her. Became, between the two of them, teamwork. 
they were able to accomplish much. So in addition to her marriage to Lapidoth, in Judges 5-7, Deborah refers to herself as a mother in Israel. Look at verse 7. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as the mother in Israel. And if you'll notice your notes, she was a revered woman in the nation. She was a revered woman. So she was devoted to God, devoted to her family, and notice thirdly, she was devoted to her country. She was devoted to her country. Verse number four. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel, look at it, came up to her for judgment. In fact, look at the map behind me, the cities that surrounded this area. If you will notice that she sat in this particular area, this area was the area called the Palm, the Palm of Deborah. And she would sit there, and the people would travel. You can see all around Israel, they would come and they would listen to the words of Deborah to be able to give them direction on hard things that went on. And so this was the issue. Now notice carefully in your notes, the text says that she would sit under a palm tree between Ramah Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim, and the people traveled to her for judgment. Can you imagine that? These people didn't just go to her because she was close. They went as far as they needed to go so that they would be able to hear the difficult cases that were brought before her. Now listen to this carefully, folks. This is unprecedented. This just doesn't happen. You don't ever have in Israel's history up to this point where you have a woman that is ruling like King David was. A woman who was in a position of leadership. Not only was she in a position of authority, but she's also a prophetess. She's actually standing in the place of of the word of God. I mean, David had, had his prophets that talked to him. This woman is occupying both parts. This is unheard of. She fulfilled the duties of a judge. She heard people complain of Jabin and Sisera's oppression. Can you imagine that? Constantly. These people are wicked. They're horrible. What are we supposed to do, Deborah? And so, this woman begins to fill with anger and concern for her nation. Things got so bad that she finally had to take a stand. Now listen carefully. Sometimes when things get difficult in your nation, you need to take the hard step of what we talked about last week. Take a stand. The problem is, is we can become the silent majority. And that's dangerous. So Deborah hears these complaints, and finally, something needs to be done. Notice verse 6 of chapter 5. Verse 6 of chapter 5. In the days of Shamgar and Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. This is a terrible time. People worshiping other gods, people coming and bowing down to them. The Bible says nobody else did anything until Deborah arose. And she rose to do something about what was going on in the nation. Again, it's hard for me to say this, but the men were cowards. The men were cowards. Do you remember Saul and Goliath? Do you remember that Saul was trying to find somebody to take on the giant? And God ended up shaming Saul by finding a young little ruddy-faced kid. And you know what the weird part of it is when you read that story? Now, now just track with me a minute. Don't you find it embarrassing if you were the king of Israel 
and the only person that you are comfortable with going out and fighting is some little kid, some young guy? Where was Saul? What was he supposed to be doing? He was supposed to be going out and fighting the wars. He was supposed to be going out and taking care of the battles, and instead he gets some young kid to do it. It's pathetic. Saul was a coward. He didn't stand up. David did. David said, I come with the power of the God of Israel. And so with Deborah, Deborah begins. That was her commitment. <clears throat> now look at it. Not only do we have Deborah's commitment, but we have Deborah's confidence. Deborah's confidence. Deborah knew that what needed to be done had to be done. She had heard about the great military strategist named Barak, which we're going to learn about. The scripture says that <clears throat> she asked him to help her deliver Israel from her enemies. But please be aware that her confidence wasn't in Barak. It was in God, and that confidence was shown itself in four specific ways. Number a, there, letter A, she was confident in God's word. Look at verse 6 of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 6. She went and summoned Barak, the son of Abinom, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Commanded you. That's it. Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000, that's all they had, from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon. Look at that. She was confident in God's word. God had told her to get Barak. Have the men gather at Mount Tabor. By the way, a trivia question. Does anyone know the significance of Mount Tabor? Anybody know about that one? Look at the picture behind me. Anybody know about Tabor? Okay, this was also known as the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember that? That was the place where Moses and Elijah came. Look at the next picture. You get kind of a, um, a scene of what this place looked like. Look at that. That's the place where they're going to meet for this battle. This is the place where Jesus would go with his disciples. And remember, Peter said, it's good for us to be here. I'm going to make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And remember, the voice came back and said, Listen to what he says, the word of God. By the way, if you go to Israel today, somebody completed Peter's building project. There's a really large church right up at the very tippy top there. But this is the place where they're traveling, this place of transfiguration. In fact, I want you to hold your place in Judges and turn over to Matthew chapter 17. I want to reiterate what I said here so that you can see it in the text. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 1. There's an interesting word that is used that I want you to circle when we get to it. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 1, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them to a high mountain by themselves. And he was metamorphosed, transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared with him Moses and Elijah. You wonder how they knew that it was Moses and Elijah. Did they go up there and say, hey, my name is Moses, my name is Elijah. Somehow they knew. But they were talking with him, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us that we are here. If you wish, I will make you three tents here for you, and the one for Moses and one for Elijah. And as he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Circle the next word. Listen, Akue, listen to him. Process the things that he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you that it's not about transfiguration. 
He's going to tell you it's about sin and the penalty for sin. Listen to Him. The words that He will tell you will save your life. So this is incredible. This is the place where it was told to the disciples to listen to Jesus, listen to His words. Peter wanted to build things. He was supposed to listen. And so she called Barak and asked him to join her. Back to our text in Judges. Now, I want you to notice that Deborah was told by God to meet with him, and I'm convinced that she believed that if she would do what God said, she'd be victorious. And so she calls Barak, asks him to join her. She says to Barak, we can do this. Because God has told us this. He's told us what we should do. By the way, that has marvelous implications for us today, doesn't it? He's told us what we are to do. Look at your notes. She knew because of God's word, she could be strong and courageous in the strength of the word of God. The strength. So not only was she confident of God's word, look at B in your notes, she was confident in God's will. This is big. She is confident in God's will. Chapter 4, verse 7. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, (laughs) <laughs> this, uh, this is embarrassing. If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. <laughs> Do you find that funny? And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you're going will not lead to your glory. You are going to get the credit for this. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. You see this? She knew God's will. God's will was that the people of Israel would be shamed because of their lack of courage. And so we see from this text that the will of God in this battle, look at your notes, would be brought about by a woman. The men, because of their lack of faith, would be shown, here it is, the humiliation of what happens when we don't man up. By the way, the whole reason for discipline is somehow to bring about humiliation. But the problem that we have now in our culture is nobody's humiliated. The problem in our culture is we're proud of sin. We display it. We celebrate it. It used to be where certain things were thought of as shame. And that's the problem with our society is They have forgot how to blush, as the Bible says. You can jot down in your notes, we don't have time to go there. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, is the story of the humiliation that was supposed to be upon uh, Adam. But of course, the problem was that Adam didn't man up, and now the consequences of his actions are everything that he does is going to be cursed with the work and the labor of sweat. He's going to have to work for it. It's not going to come easy. It's not going to always be fulfilling. There are going to be times of frustration. And all of that was brought about because he did not take the lead in protecting his wife. And by the way, the Bible also suggests in Genesis chapter 3 that one of his consequences is he's always going to be striving against his wife. His wife's going to want his position, and he's going to be struggling with that. That's the consequence of the fall. By the way, that is the consequence of what we see today within churches. Men have stepped aside, and in many churches, the old adage is, well, we can't find any qualified men to lead. So you know what happens? The churches bring about, and it's not that women aren't 
even better leaders than men. That, that wasn't the point. The point was is it wasn't God's ideal. It wasn't his headship the way he, he made it. And so Adam is, is struggling here. We're seeing playing out in Judges Adam's consequence. Because Adam subjugated to the leading of his wife, his penalty would be frustration and futility. And God reminds the men in Deborah's day how they had repeated Adam's lack of leadership and protection. That's the will of God here. Barak knew that Deborah had the blessing of God on her and he wasn't going to battle without her. And Deborah believed the word that God gave her and victory was going to be hers. By the way, God's point would be made clearly, it's all of him. It's all of him. She was confident in his word, his will. Look at the C there in your notes. She was confident in God's work. This is incredible. Verse 10. And Barak called out Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with them. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far as the oak of Zanunim, which is near Kadesh. And when Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinom, had gone up to Mount Tabor, look at this, Sisera called out to his chariots, 900 chariots of iron and all the men who were with him from Herosheth Hagim to the river Kishon. Look at this. And Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Can you imagine what Barak must have thought? What? Are you joking? Look at this. Does not the Lord go out before you? Look at that. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. I wonder how they followed. This is incredible. Notice carefully in the text, Deborah speaks in the past tense. Look at it. He has given. Not that he will give. The battle was already done. It's already a done deal. The battle has already been won. She's bold in her faith. Look at your notes. She has already rested in the promise of God's word. Isn't that great? Now remember, Barak has 10,000 men on foot. Sisera has 900 chariots, 100,000 soldiers, and they're going to meet on the river Kishon by the Megiddo Plain. Let's take a look at the picture so you can get the idea of where they're fighting. Look at that vast area there. This is where they are getting ready to meet. Chariots on both sides. A little, a little group here, a big group there. By the way, question. What other time in history is Megiddo going to place in the Bible in the future? Does anybody know? Armageddon, that's right. This is where the final battle is going to take place, the Bible says. So this is a, a, a piece of ground that is known for battle. And here they are. They're moving to this one particular spot. Now, folks, as we move through the text, you're going to see the confidence of God's work in this particular area. The most important characteristic of a Christian leader, David Jeremiah says, is whatever areas of life is a dynamic, bold faith in God. One can have all the leadership principles down pat. You can be a management expert, but if I do not trust God, if I do not live in a personal fellowship with Jesus, I will be a failure. In whatever area I serve as a leader, my only way to succeed is in the power of God's might, unquote. And that's what you're going to see here. Deborah and Barak are going out totally overwhelmed and undermanned. And from a human perspective and on paper, this is totally ridiculous. There is, folks, no chance for them to succeed. It is an impossible task. That brings us to D. She was confident in God's ways. Verse 15. 
and the Lord, look at this, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now we're going to look at the details of how this happens. Can you imagine? They're going down to meet Israel, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they're routed by God. God Almighty, capital L-O-R-D. Look at it. The Lord routed Sisera. The word routed means discomforted, confused all of his chariots, all of his army. How is the question? How? What happened here? It's between the, the, the black print and the white space. The Song of Deborah in chapter 5 gives us the details. Look over at chapter 5, verse 4. Here's what happened. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped waters. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. Drop down to verse 20. Verse 20 of chapter 5. From heaven the stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. That's what happened. It's incredible. The Almighty God let loose earthquakes and floods. And by the way, chariots don't work well in mud. Look at your notes. Sisera's army panicked, and they ran every which way. And of course, Israel chased them and hunted them down. Now, I've got something in your notes, and it's also on the screen. I want you to see exactly what happened so you get the whole picture. Take a look. You can look at it on the screen, or you can look at it on your map. There's a seven-stage uh, seven thing that happened here, and I want you to see it. Number one, Israelites, they force, uh, they, they force this thing. They, they move into the marshy lowlands of the river Kishon. Okay, so they're, they're moving in. Number two, the Canaanites deploy. The battle of the Israelites approach. Their chariots are positioned in front to deal with the men. They backed up large bodies of infantry. Look at number three. A sudden rainstorm soaks the boggy ground and makes the Canaanite chariots ineffective. Possessing none themselves, the Israelites are not affected. Isn't that great? They don't have any chariots to get stuck. Number four. The Israelite warriors surged forward, attacking the chariots with sword, spear, javelin. The foot soldiers had the advantage in this close quarters fight. Look at number five. The Canaanite general Sisera rushes to the aid of his embattled chariot force. Great judge Deborah is able to withstand his surge and defeat Sisera's force. And then that brings us then to number six. The Canaanites are pursued from the field. Some are caught while struggling to cross the river and they're killed. Others scatter and are chased for some time. And that brings us to seven. Sisera himself flees on foot, finds refuge only to be where the next story comes uh, when he meets this woman. So look at this. This is the battle plan. Folks, this is a God right here. Th this just doesn't happen. God miraculously did like what he did with the Exodus. Remember when the uh, Egyptian soldiers were going in after them and their chariots all got stuck? And the flood came and, and swept them away. Look, at this is God in action, folks. So let me, let me just say this before we go on in the story. That means that in whatever impossible situation that you are dealing with in your life, there is absolutely nothing that can get in the way of God fighting for you. I don't know about you, but that pumps me up. Because that means that when I seem like I am facing impossible situations, when I am feeling like I am going to be swept away, God is there. And He's there to fight. That's why the 
song says the battle belongs to the Lord, right? Now here's where it gets fun. All right, here's the rated R portion. Kids, plug your ears. Or not. (laughs) All right, let's take a look at it. Verse 16. Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Hashath Hagyam, and the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. That's pretty good news. Now Deborah, a prop, oh, sorry, uh, but Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. Now that's the person, that's the next character. So Sisera is a coward. He's running. He's probably wondering what in the world's going on. He flees away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazar in the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me. Don't be afraid. So he turned aside to her and to the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And then he says to her, oh, Please, can you give me a little water to drink? For I'm thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk. By the way, what happens when you drink milk? You get tired, right? Now this, this is incredible. Gives him milk, gives him a drink, and then covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes in and asks you, is anyone here, just say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. <laughs> then she went softly to him, and she drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet them and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you're seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lie Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. Oh! This is a woman's day right here. Man, you better be careful when your wife offers you milk before you go to bed. This is painful, folks. I thought I'd illustrate here. Thank you, Bob, for bringing that. Here's a tent peg. All right? Can you imagine this? Here's the poor guy sleeping. And if you even touch your temple, it hurts, right? She goes right there and bam! She's hitting that baby. I wonder how many strikes it took before it went into the ground. Look at that. I'm telling you, folks, that was one strong woman with the power of God behind her, and sunk this into Sisera's skull. That's incredible. That's the power of our God. He's awesome. This is amazing. A tent peg in the temple. Sisera's dead. And by the way, Sisera's mother thought her son was late coming home because they were busy dividing up the spoils of victory. Look at Judges chapter 5, verse 29. We get a little insight here. Here they thought that they were going to be victorious. Look at verse uh, 29. It says, Her wisest princess answer indeed. She answers herself, Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb... Or two, for every man, spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoiled of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. I love verse 31. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be as like the sun as he rises in his might. They thought that the battle was going to be a routine. Now we've seen Deborah's commitment. We've seen her confidence. Lastly, we see Deborah's courage. Deborah's courage. By the way, I want to say something about courage as we're tuning towards the end here. Courage is not the absence of fear, okay? It's in your notes. It is a resolve to trust and obey God in the face of our fears. That's courage. Courage means I'm, I'm willing to trust God in the face of the fact that I'm scared out of my mind. And I want you to see here that Deborah displays this kind of courage in two ways as we close. Number one, look at it, while engaging a terrifying enemy. 
She trusts God while she's engaging a terrifying enemy. It's one thing to be bold when you have everything that you need, chariots, soldiers. But Deborah stood up when there was no human answer to her situation. Against all odds, she stood up with courage. Though she did not know how God was going to specifically work. In the same way, we need to stand up because we fight with the enemy on a regular basis, folks. On a regular basis. And you better believe that when you stand up as a Christian, you're standing against a fierce enemy. People are not going to like what you have to say, they're not going to like the God that you love. So that's the first part. Number two, look at your notes. While employing a timid general, Barak was not willing to go into battle unless Deborah went with him. And oftentimes, those people who should be leading the charge are not. We need to stand up and remind them who the battle belongs to. Again, let me, if I could, please quote from David Jeremiah. What a mighty woman, when everyone else was kneeling down to the false gods of Canaan, Deborah stood up. When not one man presented himself to lead Israel out of bondage, Deborah stood up. When the people of Israel were wallowing in sin and self-pity, Deborah stood up. When a generation grew up and knew not the Lord nor the power of his works, Deborah stood up. When the possibility of victory over an oppressive enemy was hovering around zero, Deborah stood up. And when Satan was glad-handing his demons over the fall of Israel, Deborah was standing up. When her own husband seemed frozen in his fears, Deborah stood up. And when nobody had done anything for God in 20 long years, Deborah stood up and David Jeremiah ends, and we can stand up today if she could. Amen? Absolutely. Let me remind you this morning of what we saw in Ephesians 6. Our enemy, listen to this, our enemy will find the weakest link in our line of defense, and he'll attack us there. Let me just say that. All of us here, me leading the way, have a weak link. And the enemy will find out what that weak link is and he will attack us at that very point. We have to be ready. We have to be able to trust in God. I'm going to close here with Martin Luther's words. If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition, every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing him. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be ready and steady on all of the battlefields outside of that is mere flight and disgrace if we flinch at the point where the enemy is attacking, unquote. I don't know where the enemy is attacking you this morning. But I do know that as believers of Jesus Christ, we are all under siege. And if Deborah could stand up in her generation, so you and I can be God's man and God's woman in this present day. Let's pray.